conference is organized by Animal Health Europe, the association representing the animal health industry in Europe. And it's also hosted by Parliament Magazine. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based here in Brussels, and I'm going to be guiding us through today's conversation, which of course is coming at a very pivotal time for animal health in the European Union. So I'd first like to turn it over to our host for today. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over for introductory remarks from Roxanne Feller, Secretary General of Animal Health Europe. Roxanne? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Dave. Very shortly, uh, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, welcome Mrs. Kiriakidis, who will virtually be here with us. Of course, we're welcome our, our speakers, and last but not least, uh, a member of the Agri Committee and, and, and Mr. Norbert Linz, uh, MEP. Um, three things. Um, extremely excited to have this meeting today with you. It's our first online event. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to how this will go along, but I'm very confident. Um, I'm also very honored because uh, we have almost 500 people who have registered. And we were totally uh, overtaken by this number. So I'm, I'm very, very honored for the interest that is shown around our topic. And finally, I'm really looking forward to these debates. We have great panelists, and we will be reflecting on very high high level political uh, issues that are currently being debated. As you said, Dave, uh, farm to fork, uh, one health, sustainability, um, antibiotic resistance, and all these through the lens of uh, the animal health sector. So enough for me. Um, I let you run the show, Dave, and, and thank you again for hosting this for us. Thanks, Roxanne. So, yeah, I mean, we can tell from the amount of registrations that we've received for this event that interest in this topic is really high. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. Here in Brussels, of course, we've had two very important pieces of policy come out in the past year, which really touch on this topic. One is the EU Green Deal, and the other is the Farm to Fork strategy, which came out in May, which deals specifically, of course, with agriculture. And both of these have come out at a time when livestock and food production are really under the spotlight in Europe. The issue has been getting a lot of news coverage and has been subject to many studies and reports, all of which are being poured over by policymakers and stakeholders trying to figure out the best solutions for Europe. And when it comes to the farm to fork strategy specifically, there have been a lot of ideas floating around since it was unveiled about how the EU can meet the quite ambitious objectives it sets out. Out. So today we have a number of distinguished speakers to give their thoughts on this topic. We're going to start with opening speeches from EU Health Commissioner Kyriakides and European Parliament Agriculture Committee Chair Norbert Linz. Uh, Mr. Linz will also be part of the debate which will follow. Uh, that panel debate, uh, we have a number of distinguished people there who are going to really discuss the nitty-gritty of how we can implement the farm to fork strategy and improve sustainability uh, in uh, the animal health area, specifically asking this question, what does it look like? What are the practical implications on the ground when uh, you have sustainable animal health? Uh, so uh, during the course of this event, you guys are going to have the opportunity to ask us questions, and you can do that via Slido. I don't know how many of you have used this app Slido before, but if you log on to it, you want to enter hashtag sustainable livestock. Uh, now, that can be done either online or with the app. Uh, if you go to uh, sli.do, you can enter that there, and then you can enter in your questions at any time during today's event. And then during the Q&A portion at the end, I'm going to be reading out your questions. Uh, feel free to identify yourself in the question. If you do, I will read out your name. If you want to be anonymous, that's okay, too. I won't read out your name. Uh, we'll also be having this debate on Twitter live. The hashtag is the same there. Sustainable Sustainable Livestock and Animal Health Europe is going to be live tweeting the whole event. So let's start with our opening remarks from Commissioner Kyriakita. She sent us a recorded special video message. So let's play that now. Dear members of Animal Health Europe, dear committee chair Linz, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to open your debate today on sustainability in livestock. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown more than ever the importance of the One Health approach, recognizing that animal, human, environmental health are interdependent. 
The fact that recent epidemics from Ebola to SARS to West Nile virus are zoonotic has important implications for our farming practices. It also shows more than ever that animal health matters. These outbreaks raise awareness of the links between our own health and the health of our ecosystems. The Green Deal and especially the biodiversity and farm to fork strategy provide tools and targets to address the current imbalance. One of the lessons learned from the ongoing crisis is that animal health surveillance systems play an important role in anticipating, detecting and containing outbreaks. These should be increasingly integrated with surveillance systems for human health. Here, the EU is a world leader and as part of our response to future health threats, we will strengthen the interconnections between our agencies, such as European Food Safety Authority, European Medicines Agency and the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. The Commission, through recently adopted legislation on animal health, veterinary, medicinal products and medicated feed, will promote a more prevention-driven approach to animal health. There are many tools that veterinarians and farmers can use to promote both animal health and more sustainable farming practices. I'm delighted to hear how members of Animal Health Europe have been active when it comes to vaccines, diagnostic, digital monitoring tools, biosecurity measures and adopting innovative feed and housing methods. Another key element in the interconnection between animals, humans and the environment is antimicrobial resistance. Veterinarians and farmers around Europe have been playing key part in the prudent use of antimicrobials. This is reflected in the latest report from the European Medicines Agency from 2019, which shows that the sales of antibiotics for use in animals in Europe fell by more than 32 percent between 2011 and 2017. However, if we are to tackle the enormous burden of AMR, we need to be even more ambitious. One of the targets set in the Farm to Fork strategy is to reduce the overall sales of antimicrobials for farmed animals and in aquaculture by 50%. This will make an important contribution to more sustainable food systems. The new regulations on veterinary medicines and medicated feed will help farmers to achieve this objective and promote One Health. Better animal welfare also improves animal health and reduces the need for medication. It is also clear that citizens want this. 94% of EU citizens care about animal welfare and underline the importance of animal health as a prerequisite for animal welfare. As announced in the Farm to Fork strategy, the Commission will evaluate and revise the existing animal welfare legislation. In all of this, you and your members can contribute to our ambitious goals. I wish you all a productive debate and I welcome your support in working with the Commission to promote animal health and welfare and deliver on the ambition set in the Farm to Fork strategy. Thank you. There you have it from the commissioner. I think it's interesting there that she stressed some of the work that's already been done in this area, especially uh, the reduction in the use of antimicrobials in Europe, which isn't necessarily matched in other parts of the world. And also, I think she gave an indication there of some of the legislative tools that the EU has at its disposal in order to meet uh, the objectives set out in the farm to fork strategy. So let's talk a little bit about what she said. We're going to move on to the debate portion of our uh, event. And that's really asking the question, what does sustainability look like? Um, there is a lot of debate to be had here, because if you look at both the Council and the European Parliament, we're seeing opposing views from the agriculture and environment committees. And what's become clear is that dialogue is really sorely needed to find bridges between these two perspectives, which are not necessarily contradictory, but are looking at things from a different point of view. And that's what we're going to try to do today. Um, 
So to get the perspective of the Agriculture Committee, let's hear from MEP Norbert Linz. He is the chair of that committee, and he's going to give us some introductory remarks to kick off our debate. Norbert? Apologies, Norbert had an issue connecting with his uh, video. He's reconnecting now with his tablet. Oh, here he is on the line. Okay, Norbert, can you see us? Okay. You hear Sorry. something? Sorry? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, we don't see you yet. Uh, where did you go? Now he's gone again. Uh, let's see. Well, while we're waiting for Norbert to reconnect, let me take this opportunity to introduce the rest of our panel uh, who's going to be speaking after him or maybe before if we have to wait a little bit for him to reconnect. So let me introduce the rest of our panelists here. First, we have Jude Capper. He is a UK-based livestock sustainability consultant. And we have Kurt Sannen, organic cattle and sheep farmer and chair of Organic Europe's Organics Working Group. Then we have Martin Schulten, former director of animal sciences at Wageningen University, and since June, principal advisor to the university's executive board. And finally, we have Julie Fermuten, uh, representing Animal Health Europe. They're all going to be giving their thoughts on some of these issues, and particularly these issues of how the sustainability aspects can interact with other aspects when it comes to animal health. Uh, so let's see if we have Norbert back on the line yet. Uh, it appears not. No word from Norbert. Maybe let's go to our panel discussion so maybe Norbert can join us uh, then after. Um, maybe, uh, Julie, do you want to start just by giving a reaction to uh, the health commissioner's comments? Uh, yes, sure. Thank Dave. Um, of course, uh, the commissioner is very supportive of uh, all, all the work we do, and uh, I, I thank her very much for it. Uh, uh, doesn't work. That's the problem. I, yeah, I've had a different link in a way than than. than, than <laughs> I think that's Norbert speaking. Norbert, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry. Um, I think I have a problem with my video, but you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Do you want to just give your, give your thoughts by audio? Yeah, so okay, sorry, Julie, uh, I think I will control. deliver I will deliver my introduction statement uh, yeah, just uh, for audio. Yeah? Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, uh, the, the video doesn't work. So, um, yeah, dear... Uh, members of um, Animal Health, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank you very much for the invitation to this very important debate. Um, one of the aspects of uh, the European Commission's farm to fork strategy is to make the livestock, uh, livestock sector more sustainable and to improve animal welfare and animal health, what the Commissioner mentioned before. I'm sure that everyone agrees on the goal but let me make an educated guess by saying that there will be much debate on the how. I would like to share with you some views on the Parliament and on my own personal view on the important issue of the coming months and developments. Let us first start with two goals of the Farm to Fork. The transformation of production methods to deliver better climate and environmental results or the 50% reduction of the sales of antimicrobials. We all agree that we need to mitigate the impact on climate and environment and that we have to do more on animal welfare. The farm to fork should promote the most sustainable carbon efficient methods of livestock production. Let me be very clear. 
I don't support anything or anyone that wants to end livestock farming and meat production or consumption in Europe. Yes, we need to find innovative solutions and need to be more sustainable, but all with viable solutions for the livestock, livestock farming sector. And we have a lot of le legislation or strategy, uh, strategies in the pipeline. The new CAP, the Messan strategy, the Farm to Fork report in the European Parliament, and so on. It will be a lot of work, but it is worth it for our consumers and our agriculture. Now coming to a very important topic in the Farm to Fork and for animal health, AMR. I welcome the goal of reducing 50% of antimicrobials. As Commissioner Kiedis pointed out rightfully, we already have good adopted legislation in place on animal health, veterinary med medicinal products and medicated feed. And this will promote a more prevention-driven approach to animal health. I want to be very clear here. The connection between animal and human health is huge. Thus, I think it is valid and important to make sure that antimicrobials are used responsibly and that alternatives are promoted. We need a mix of con conventional medicines and alternatives. Coming to the next topic, animal welfare. The EP is already active on the two points that affect animal welfare. The labeling of additional animal welfare services on individual products with an EU-wide label is definitely an issue that will be reflected in the implementation report of the Agriculture Committee. This report is currently in preparation and will be presented in autumn. Animal welfare, especially during transport, is the subject of an EP inquiry committee that will start its work in autumn and then submit a report to the vote after nine months at the latest. In both subject areas, I support a holistic approach Animals are an irreplaceable part of agriculture, not only as living beings, but also as a source of an essential part of our diet. However, these diverse relationships must be represented in a legal framework that makes sense. During the informal Council of Agriculture Ministers last week, we discussed in length a possible animal welfare labeling. I agree with Minister Julia Blöckner that we need to meet consumers' expectations regarding animal welfare. This is a growing concern in all our countries, which will deeply impact our supply chains and accelerate a shift to local and regional consumption. However, such labels must not restrict the possibility possibilities of manufacturers and processors in terms of their entrepreneurial freedom. Maybe we can also discuss this briefly in the, de in the debate. I come to my conclusion. We have a lot to do and discussions will be tough. To kick off the debate, I want to end with this. From a parliament's point of view, we have to make sure that these tasks are phrased in a realistic way and supported by all actors in the farm to folk. Openness for change on the producer side must be include appreciation on the consumer side. So thank you very much and I am looking forward to the debate. Thank you very much, Norbert. Glad you were able to get reconnected there. So let's go back to Julie. I think since you had started already giving your reactions to uh, the commissioner. Now you can also uh, give your reaction to Norbert. Um, what are your main thoughts on how we improve sustainability? Thanks again, Dave. So um, yeah, the first thought is that um, most of the world has spent the last few months thinking mainly about human health, and it's quite understandable. However, 
if we're really worried about human health, we should be equally be aware of the importance of animal health, uh, as Norbert just said, and particularly farm animals, because animal health really matters, and not for, only for those animals uh, on a farm eh, that produce our food, but also for the fish and the companion animals. And yes, fish get medication too, and get vaccines as well. Good animal health is essential. It protects the human health, and it protects the life of the environment we live in. And therefore, we need to do what we can to reduce those health risks. Um, and those of us working in the animal health industry believe that taking a holistic approach um, to animal husbandry is the future. And that's one that's fully aligned with the One Health approach, as uh, suggested by Madame Kiriakides. And this way, we make the engagement between humans, farm animals, the environment more balanced and more rewarding. So while we look to the way forward, it, it's also worth examining just how much we've already achieved in our pursuit to generally sustainable food production in Europe. It will help remember our farmers and those around them, uh, and I'm thinking of their families, I'm thinking of the veterinarians, uh, of the feed producers, and many more, what they're capable of, and how they could be inspired for new achievements. No single farming system can currently deliver on all the three pillars of sustainability. However, our industry believes regular veterinary visits, quality animal health management, and preventive vaccination when possible can take us there. And this needs to be combined with effective biosecurity measures, appropriate housing and nutrition, farming trainings to new techniques, and many more other possibilities. And this is a, an all um, uh, comprehensive approach to animal husbandry. And Europe should include in its support measures all farming approaches, be they conventional, organic, agroecological, and the objective must be to secure a sustained supply of affordable and safe food uh, to meet the growing demand. And in the same time, we have to ensure that non-farmed land is preserved and that the biodiversity is maintained. And what will this take? Together in Europe, we need to adopt and to incentivize the new methods for prevention, including new disease de de detection techniques, and investments are needed in monitoring and surveillance to aid disease preparedness and response. The good news is that uh, the R&D departments of the animal health industry invest heavily in this. Uh, we do more than that. It. It's a huge challenge, I know, but if we are to do this and do it effectively, Europe will become an inspiration on how to pursue a sustainable and modern approach to agriculture. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. Let's turn next to somebody who's really working with these issues on the ground. Jude, um, what, in your view, does sustainability, sustainability look like in practical terms for animal health? Hi there. Thank you so much. It's a real um, pleasure to be talking on this panel. So, yes, from my point of view, I'm going to talk about this very much from the um, on-farm point of view, but also under the wider auspices of both animal health and one Health, and I really firmly believe that there is no one-size-fits-all system, solution, or indeed even practices, either now or in the future, except that really um, throughout the globe, every livestock farm has to be absolutely the best, everything that they do now and everything that they do in the future. So what that means is having the very best animal health and welfare. And as we've obviously heard earlier, animal health and welfare are absolutely key concerns for consumers and indeed for all food system stakeholders. And yet we often see that there's a real or a perceived dichotomy between efficiency, productivity and animal health and welfare. And we've really got to work harder to bridge that gap to understand animal behavior, animal welfare, animal health, productivity and see where we can improve all of these metrics concurrently because we know from a large body of research that improving both productivity and efficiency improve sustainability, both from the environmental and the economic perspective. But what we really need to investigate further are the impacts of animal health and disease, which do have impacts on efficiency and productivity. So at the moment, globally, we really don't have a good understanding of how individual diseases and symptoms and syndromes affect resource use, affect greenhouse gases, and also affect the economic sustainability of livestock systems. 
And farmers really do need to, uh, to know and to understand how their livestock health status affects their farm's environmental footprints and their economics, because fairly obviously they can't make changes if they don't have the data and the in information to support this. So we also need to really focus on reducing and eradicating the diseases that have the greatest impact on the environment, on farm economics and on the wider One Health agenda. And although we're learning more and more about the use of antimicrobials in livestock production and the relationship with AMR, we also need to be able to link this both to environmental and economic sustainability metrics. We've got to use the latest and best technologies to improve animal health, both in terms of direct disease prevention treatment, but also in optimizing the animal's environment management and nutrition, including the use of feed additives to improve efficiency and cut greenhouse gas emissions. And we've got to do that in a holistic manner, not just on the farm, but all the way through the chain, so that farmers, vets, the animal health industry, retailers and processors are all involved in making these changes. So to sum up, if we can be the best in absolutely everything that we do, it will give us those environmental and economic benefits, but it should also improve consumer perception and the license to operate that we're obviously going to need going forward. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jude. Let's turn next to Kurt, who's also working with these issues on the ground. Kurt, what are your thoughts in on what sustainability looks like for animal health? Here we are. Okay, thank you. Um, it's it's a very inspirational discussion, and I'm very happy with uh, the different objectives that who has been set by all the the speakers until now. And um, it thinks me on what happened on my farm 20 years ago. I was a conventional farmer and um, my veterinarian uh, was somebody who sold me or tried to sell me a lot of medicines and uh, the common agricultural policy in those days was stimulating me to become more intensive, uh, bigger and so on. But um, the last 12 years I became organic and um, my veterinarian is now my partner on my farm who helps me to have more healthier uh, animals. And I think the transition which happened on my farm can be inspirational for the transition we need uh, on the European level. Um, and, and you see that there is, of course, um, the, the, the uh, relation between common agricultural policy and uh, how we uh, evolve as farmers. And I think there is a big, uh, big challenge to make this uh, happen with this new common agricultural policy. We have very interesting uh, goals um, with the farm to fork strategy. Uh, if if I, I heard that for the first time, I, I was very happy with that. Uh, it's a very good, clear direction to make European uh, agriculture more sustainable. And um, common agriculture policy is the best way to implement this all over Europe. But then we need to take that challenge and change a lot in the way common agricultural policy is now. And uh, we have now eco-regulations and all different kinds of um, environmental measures we, which can be set on, on the farm level. And um, every European country should be stimulated to make the best of it and um, so that there is an, enough money going to farmers who want to uh, take all these challenges to make uh, these green goals on their farm. Thanks very much, Kurt. Uh, let's continue on down the line here and go to Martin. Uh, Martin, what in your does uh, sustainable animal health look like? Yeah. Well, actually, what I hear this afternoon is that uh, we seem to be very uh, like-minded in, in, in that respect. And, and, and I think an important part that I want to echo is that a sustainable livestock and a healthy livestock are two sides of one coin. Uh, uh, there is no sustainable livestock when we are not caring about the health of the animals. Uh, 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 and vice versa, uh, 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 the health of the animal care, uh, the, the, the care for animal health is only relevant if we have a food 
production, uh, including uh, uh, animal production, including livestock. And I think that's an important thing to consider, that sustainability of the entire food system, the future food system, is not a food system without animals. Animals has a role uh, to uh, help uh, sustainability in that uh, uh, food system. Uh, by, uh, food, food production is biology by its nature. So we have nature-based challenges, we have ba nature-based approaches to improve the uh, sustainability of our food system. But livestock is part of that. When it comes to natural resource use efficiency, livestock has a role to play to make sure that all what we are producing in, in the food system is being used and is being uh, uh, um, uh, 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 contributing to the, to the food production. Uh, Nature-based circular. But having said that, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about what I see also in the farm to fork strategy about ways to go. It is about the transition of the food system, a transition of the food system probably with less uh, uh, animal production. Uh, uh, it, it is sometimes, uh, uh, and, and another part is uh, the innovation and the transformation of the food system to be more uh, uh, sustainable. I think we really need a smart, balanced approach with a transformation, transition, and reduction, and not keep one horse in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the game. Uh, so it's a blend of that. And, 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 and when I think of, of that, we, we have to realize that sustainability is, is, is related to diversity. It's been said by others as well. Uh, we need a diverse uh, uh, food system. We need a diverse uh, 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 livestock system. Probably the livestock system in the future is different from the livestock system now. And then I come to my last point. What is then the role of animal health uh, uh, care in that? Uh, it, it, it's quite crucial. Uh, uh, livestock can only play a role when we have a resilient livestock, when we have an adapted livestock, when we have more breeds, when we have more options to feed the animals, when we use the manure uh, produced by animals much better. Uh, but that requires a, a preventive animal uh, health situation. Um, we are now facing a zoonotic emergency. Uh, 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 this one doesn't directly impact the livestock sector, the livestock itself. But uh, we have to be aware that, that there will not be a sentiment due to fear of the zoonotics, uh, emergent zoonotics, that 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 brings uh, a situation when we think uh, uh, we can produce without uh, animals. So uh, uh, we have to be prepared from a one health perspective in uh, a zoonotic emergency uh, uh, preparedness and and having uh, the right interventions in uh, in place. And I think Animal Health Europe can play an important role in that. And 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 that's not only to have a healthy one health. Uh, 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 food system, but also to have a sustainable food system because, again, I repeat and I end up, I conclude with, there is no sustainable food system without animal production. I can explain more when there are questions. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, let me first ask a question to Norbert, who I see, I think, has, is reconnected with the video. That's great. Um, so first off, I want to see, Norbert, if you have any reaction to anything said by the panelists so far. Uh, but second, I wanted to ask you, I think in a lot of people's minds, greener agriculture automatically means smaller agriculture. They would equate greener and more sustainable with smaller. Do you agree with that characterization? And if so, if some kind of size adjustment is needed, what kind of socioeconomic impact would that have on farmers? How do we make such a transition fair to people who are working in agriculture? <clears throat> so thank you very much. So yeah, now it's better <laughs> that you can uh, that you can see me, and then um, uh, there is a there is a, a camera. Yeah, just to 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 answer your uh, question as, as short as uh, possible, 
I don't think uh, that we should um, follow this black and white uh, uh, debate. Then uh, smaller means um, means greener and means um, more uh, sustainable. Uh, I'm coming from a region where we have smaller uh, farms. Uh, I uh, I would not come to the uh, to the solution or or uh, to 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 the assessment. Uh, that uh, means um, uh, that always means uh, it, it is better it is better uh, for livestock uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to be uh, part of a, to be part of a, a smaller um, a smaller pound no it uh, depends on um, it uh, depends on the method it depends on the used uh, technologies it depends on what uh, uh, that they follow that they follow uh, the the science and all these things are more important uh, that than the question uh, how um, how large or how uh, small uh, is the fowl and and I fully agree with Jude when she uh, when she mentioned that the latest and the best uh, technologies uh, uh, should be used um, uh, when it comes uh, uh, <clears throat> when it comes to to livestock yeah? or uh, what um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Senan said, so I'm of the opinion that organic farming uh, could be one of the solution, uh, but then uh, um, uh, it's only it's not a question only of production or how uh, um, this organic production uh, take place. Uh, it's a question for the whole uh, food um, uh, supply uh, chain uh, and the question uh, how productive uh, can uh, organic uh, farming be in the future. So the question of productivity um, is uh, one uh, challenge for uh, the organic um, uh, for the organic um, uh, uh, farming sector. And what Mr. Scholten said that innovation is is needed, uh, and uh, there is no sustainable food production when there are no uh, more animals um, included in in our. Uh, diets, I fully agree uh, with this um, with this uh, assessment. Thank you. Uh, Norbert, you mentioned organic farming. So let me put that question to Kurt. Uh, there, there are targets on the table for increasing organic farming. Uh, maybe you want to react to what Norbert said. And also, I would put to you the um, same question. If we are going to be increasing organic farming, should there be rewards for farmers that commit to uh, setting aside be part of their land to organic farming. Thank you. Um, organic farming can be a very interesting inspiration for the transition all the agriculture sector in Europe can and needs to do. I don't mean that organic farming has all the answers, but I think we must be modest. We help us um, to find answers to all these big challenges. And I think in organic farming, we have already done a lot. So I'm very happy with the goal of 25% uh, of the farm to fork strategy. It will be a big challenge, but uh, we take that challenge and I'm sure we will, we will do this. And um, I remember Commissioner um, Wojciechowski, or uh, Agricultural Commissioner in a, in a webinar a few months ago saying, um, that the future of agriculture in Europe should not be more intensification, more industrialization, and more um, uh, kilometers done by our food and feed all over the world. I was very happy hearing saying this because, yes, I think a greener agriculture, a more sustainable agriculture, means that uh, we should stop stimulate agriculture in Europe becoming more intensive and more industrialized like CAP is doing now. Until today, CAP is saying to me as a farmer, become bigger, then you will have more subsidies, then you're a good farmer. If you stay a small farmer, then you're a bad farmer. So I'm uh, referring also to definitions of a uh, uh, farmer, for instance, in the CAP discussion uh, where this is about. So I think, yes, uh, we need a big diversification of farmers. And uh, like Mr. Scholten said, I think that's the real good future, not one type of farm, but a big diversification in a very diverse landscape, producing very diverse 
food and feed to make Europe uh, more sustainable in agriculture. And um, I think in, in this way, again, organic farming and agroecology can help us to set out how we can do this. Julie, let me put that question to you because I think what Kurt's describing there is certainly an element of, of shrinking, at least with transport distances and this type of element. Do you think that there is inevitably some aspect of shrinking here that we're talking about when we're talking about sustainability and animal health? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure it's our role to, uh, to, 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 to come out on this, on this matter. I think uh, we, as a pharmaceutical industry, as a veterinary pharmaceutical industry, are there for all animals, be it on big farms, small farms, organic farms, hobby farms. Uh, so th that's one thing. And I'd like to, um, to also quote uh, Minister Julia Kluckner. Um, because she said that holy farm, uh, holy farming, yeah, you can call it holy farming. <laughs> Organic farming is not the holy grail, uh, and um, conventional conventional farming is not the devil. So uh, organic farming must become more efficient, that's for sure, and conventional farming must become more sustainable. And when it comes to us uh, as uh, animal health industry, how it, how can we make uh, the animal health more sustainable? We have various methods. Uh, we're working very hard on more on the precision farming, um, so having a more targeted approach per animal. Um, we have a lot of tools that have been developed and really making progress. Um, we're also working very hard on, on prevention, so different preventative measures. And I'm looking beyond only vaccines. Eh? It's uh, the whole list that I've uh, enumerated before. So th that's more, I think, our role in, in this debate to come with this vision. Jude, let me turn to you. When you are working uh, you know, with the agriculture sector in, in these sustainability solutions. What are you hearing from people? Are they also making this equation between big is bad, small is good? Uh, and what are they thinking in terms of a fair transition, how uh, these types of transitions that we're talking about can be made fair for farmers? That's a really good question. And this is gonna sound a little bit of a cop-out answer. It obviously depends which audience I'm talking to um, as to which answer I'm getting about, you know, big is bad, big is good, small is good, small is bad. Certainly from my perspective and in my experience, I really feel we can't generalize. Um, there are some excellent small farms and some excellent big farms. There are some poorer, you know, big and small farms, and it is absolutely down to management. And I would echo um, Julie's comments that, you know, rather than sort of having a, this is good, this is bad, we have to improve all the way through and we have to improve productivity in one sector and sustainability in another. Um, my one concern, um, given that I'm very research and, and, and um, sort of data-based within my work, is that if, if we take a sort of arbitrary target of 25% being organic, for example, do we push more productivity um, more of a productivity burden, as it were, on, onto the conventional sector. So we risk negative trade-offs in favouring one sector over another. Um, because ultimately, if we learn from each other, and I mean, there are certainly things done on organic farms which are absolutely innovative and fabulous, and also on conventional farms. So it becomes less of an us against them. And I am good because I do this. They are bad because they don't do that. Than a everybody can be good. Everybody can improve. And I've been to some of the best farms and probably some of the worst farms. Um, and they can all improve and they can all learn. And I think if we have more discussion, more debate, more open um, without borders, without assumptions, without you know, m making the generalization that an organic farmer must look like this and a conventional farmer must look like that. If we have more open debate and more value sharing about what is farming, what is agriculture, what is animal health, those conversations seem to go really well. I, th I think we, whatever the um, agenda or the situation, we put ourselves into boxes a little bit when we talk about organic over here and conventional over here. 
while recognising that on almost any farm, there's a mix of both practices, but we can pigeonhole ourselves to such an extent that we get acrimony within the industry and that spills out to consumers, retailers, government, etc. So perhaps we need more diversity, but almost more unity within the industry to enable those conversations and enable us to learn from each other. It's an interesting point about potential unintended consequences of organic targets. Kurt, would you agree with that call for kind of flexibility in defining what is organic? Uh, Kurt, your microphone is off. Here we are again. Hello. Um, I, I don't like a, a polarized debate on organic or non-organic. I'm a farmer, like all other farmers. And by coincidence, well, it's not a coincidence, of course, I have an organic label, but my farm is my farm and it has an organic label. I'm working with nature organizations. I do so many different things. I'm more than just an organic farmer. Like my other colleagues, they all have good things, bad things, and we all can become more sustainable and we can do more good practices on the farm. Me also. It's not because that I am organic that I'm the best farmer. No, it's just a label. Not less, not more. And it's an important label. It's um, regulated by EU law. It's strong. Everybody knows it. It's simple. You can see it uh, in the shop on the shelf with a very known label. So it's it's clear. So I'm I'm not happy of saying yeah we can make a label a little bit fuzzy and 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 everybody who is doing something good can be organic. I think that's not the good conclusion of of this debate. The good conclusion is that um, again. We, we, we should, in, of course, invest on organic farming and, and talking about organic needs to be more productive. Yeah, of course. Uh, but think that that production gap is not specific for organic. It's because there is a research gap. It's already over, I uh, spent more than 100 years uh, research in conventional agriculture. But on organic agriculture, there's almost yeah, not, not much research. In my country, in Flanders, there's not even one professor on a university doing research on organic farming. So I think we can be more productive, but the, the, the question is not, um, do we need to produce more? Uh, if we, uh, a lot of authors saying that the more we produce here in the West, the more hunger there is in the world because our intensive way of production takes a lot of energy, uh, feed and so on, from uh, other um, parts in the world. So the question is not efficiency, but I think sufficiency. Can we produce what we need in a sustainable way in Europe? And for me as a farmer, my farm income is, is more uh, important than how much I produce. If I produce thousands of kilos of meat or one kilo of meat, I don't care if I have a fair income, then I'm happy as a farmer. So the discussion about um, do we need to lower our um, livestock? Of course, we need that. We can't uh, reach all those goals we've mentioned today with the population of livestock we have now. Well, but for me as a farmer, we need to find a way. How can I have a fair income with less livestock? And how can we produce in a sufficient way uh, what we need in Europe on a sustainable way. Thank Julie, you. did you have your hand raised? Go ahead. No, I, I didn't, but actually uh, I'd like to ask Kurt a question, if I may. Um, and, and maybe also to clarify for the audience, because I understood we had a big one. Um, I'd like to make clear that organic farming, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Kurt, doesn't exclude the use of uh, medication and vaccines. If an animal is ill, you treat it. And if you needed to treat it with an antibiotic to save him and to save your income, you will do it, I suppose. Of course. Um, everybody can read what the organic regulation says about the use of um, animal medicines. And of course, when an animal is ill, ill um, and your veterinarian is saying that it needs medicines, we need to give it medicines and else it would not be uh, good for the animal welfare. Uh, but 
we don't use um, uh, medicines in a preventive way, only to cure when an animal is ill, uh, is ill, but not in advance to prevent it to become ill. We use other ways of prevention to make sure our um, animals are, are healthy. Um, Martin, I wanted to ask you a question before opening it up to the audience. I've got a lot of questions coming here in on Slido, which is great. Uh, but Martin, I know that you guys are a proponents of this idea of circular agriculture. And I wanted to ask you, in terms of the, the EU circular economy plan, we have agriculture mentioned in there a bit. Um, what about the Green Deal? Do you think that the Green Deal is taking enough consideration uh, into how livestock can contribute to the circular economy? how agriculture intersects with the circular economy. What's your view on that? Yeah, my view is that I, I, I do not recognize the, uh, uh, the thinking about circularity, the thinking of the benefits of circularity in the Green Deal that much. Uh, so it seems that the Green Deal, uh, like uh, when it comes to agriculture, that it, uh, it, 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 it's like what we've tend to do uh, over the 50 years uh, uh, in, in, in the past, uh, saying how we have to uh, uh, do the farming rather than uh, 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 thinking about uh, uh, what is the optimi optimum uh, uh, farming? And, and 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 yeah, connecting to the discussion about organic farming, I, I fully I'm, 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 I fully agree with uh, with what Kurt is saying. Uh, actually, uh, a, a good farm system is is being based on on on, on diversity of farmer practices and, and 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 types of farms and and. and uh, 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 but it's we sh we and, and it depends on the entrepreneurship. It, that depends on the craftsmanship of the farmer. Uh, but we also have to have a, a good look. What what are we doing with the resources? And and that's what I'm I'm missing. Uh, I think in the organic farming the best. Uh, thing in organic farming, which is inspiring for the whole farming for all the farming systems, is to care about the soils. But I'm doubting a bit about the resource use efficiency. Yeah, the conventional farming way is not resource efficient or sufficient. I like that word, good. Uh, but uh, uh, in organic farming, there is also uh, uh, room for improvement when it comes to uh, 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 resource use efficiency. And, and the circularity is there. So uh, I always say to organic farmers, do not lay back when it comes to circularity. You claim you're circular, but be honest and, and look at your practice. You, you can be more circular. That holds for organic farming. That holds for uh, all kinds of other farms. Um, my way of thinking, and that's what I'm missing in the, in the from farm to fork strategy is much like the common uh, 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 agricultural policies always, it is a one size fits all. Whereas what we need is to understand that Europe has different landscapes, has different societies, has different opportunities to produce food. I'm really concerned when I see that on the best soils, because the soil is the basis, that is what we can learn from the organics, that on the best soils, not the ecological intensification is being used. Even more in the Netherlands, I see the best agricultural soils uh, are getting out of the agriculture and are brought to buildings and, 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 and air, airports, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. I think when you have a good agricultural soil, you have the uh, responsibility to come up with ecological intensification, which is not the same as uh, 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 the intensification driven uh, of the past decades, but from the perspective of using every part of the mineral uh, 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 that, that, that's in the system, reusing it, uh, et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, on marginal soils, we have to consider a more uh, uh, multifunctional extensification. There is where we need the ex uh, uh, extensification. Uh, 
So it is not one, it is not or intensification or extensification. It's ecological intensification or multifunctional uh, extensification with a multifunctional extensification uh, being uh, adaptive to, uh, to, the, uh, to the environment. Uh, 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 adaptive and resilient systems, that's what we need. And there comes the role of the veterinarians and the veterinarian sector in. Indeed, like what Kurt is saying, not producing uh, medicines to have animal production uh, 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 pressing and pressing the animal production, but using a preventive health care, including medicines and vaccines, to uh, uh, improve the life of the animal and to, to, to make it a resilient and reduced uh, animal. Not only the top breeds, but all the breeds, the, the craftsmanship, the understanding of, of veterinarians, also to know about the needs of local breeds, because local breeds probably fits better in the circularity than the top breeds, uh, uh, breeds that only can uh, uh, live on uh, uh, superfeed. Okay. So organic material, I, I stop, uh, 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 Dave, the organic farming has the soil in the center. Uh, I think we also keep keen on having the animal care in the center and a good balance between the animal care and the soil care. But for the animal care, we should not forget. Otherwise, we are only looking for the soil and, and, and crop production related to soil. Indeed. I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. Now we have a first question on labeling coming from Natasha Foote from Your Active. She asks, how can we ensure a balance between the proposed different labels, such as Nutriscore, animal welfare, organic, et cetera, and make sure consumers understand the best choice for them? Who wants to take that question on labeling? Julie, okay, go ahead. I'll just quickly start and then let the, the floor to the others. There's one uh, project from the German presidency in which we are extremely interested in, that's the animal welfare labeling. Uh, there's a, a, a very quick take at this, is um, that whatever will be behind that labeling, uh, one, it should take into account that a healthy animal is an animal that feels well, it's like human beings. Uh, and two, uh, that in the development of that label, um, you take substantiated information into account. And what we've seen now for, for a long time, but especially uh, also now in, the, in, in COVID times, there's a, there's a lot of fake news going around. And what we would really like to be in that label, that it's based on science and not on perception of whomever says, okay, this is animal welfare or that's animal welfare. There, there, there are plenty cr criteria. In those criteria, we also like to include animal health. Jude, you also had a response? I think that's a great point. And just to add from the um, consumer point of view, from the sort of social science research, we know that people generally, when they shop, they spend a very sh short time choosing between products. They tend to buy on price. They tend to buy on past experience. They tend to buy um, on on taste. Um, so I think one of the main concerns, and, and obviously in the UK we have a lot of labelling systems at Pheasant, is firstly, will the consumers understand what the labels mean? And secondly, will they actually notice the labels? Will they look at them? Will they actually take the time to make an informed decision about product A over product B? Or are we better served by putting more information out there in a form that consumers do look at, whatever that might be? Okay, I'm going to take the next question from Slido. A reminder, the hashtag to log on to Slido is sustainable livestock. That will get you in to be able to ask a question. Um, we have a question on the cap. Um, so someone asked, an anonymous person asked, what can the future CAP post-2020 do to make animal husbandry more sustainable in the future? I don't think we've touched too much on CAP so far. Does anyone have a thought on what could be done in CAP to increase sustainability? Yep, Kurt. CAP can do, of course, a lot on sustainability, and uh, we have now new ideas about uh, eco schemes and agri-environmental measures. And I think we should 
put a big emphasis on these instruments more than the direct payments. For everybody who doesn't know how it works, now it's simple, you are a farmer and you get some money from the European Commission. That's it. It's strange, eh? it's a lot of money. It's one of the biggest budgets of the European Commission. So I think it would be very interesting to couple on, on these subsidies uh, some standards so we, we can produce public goods as a farmer and that we will pay for that. Because that's very important. Farmers, uh, the farm income is very low, lower half, uh, it's half the income of an average in a, a European uh, citizen. So uh, it's important that it is supported, but it, is, it needs to be supported in a very smart way. So it stimulates us as a farmer to become more um, sustainable and the, um, uh, rewarding us for producing ecosystem services. I think this is the best way to do it. And also animal health conditions can be part of these um, eco schemes and and uh, the um, annual environmental measures. I think if we are a little bit creative, we can can find some um, uh, links. Like for instance, uh, in an emphasis on grassland. Uh, nowadays, you see more and more cattle staying inside the stable. If we have uh, a subsidy for uh, cattle on grassland and uh, more. Um, diverse grasslands, then uh, we have an animal welfare and environmental uh, goals together. Okay, so Norbert had a response, and then we'll go to Martin after that. Norbert? Yeah, maybe just I, I, I fully agree what what Kurt said, and um, as you may know, no, we are now um, in in the final uh, final uh, negotiation. Uh, around uh, that, uh, or hopefully that we are able to come uh, to a position in the European Parliament, and there's a, a lot of there are a lot of elements in. He mentioned um, the eco schemes, um, and um, uh, that there is a need uh, uh, to increase the agri environmental uh, measures. I fully agree there, uh, and there is the idea in the European Parliament, and that's not the idea from from one group. Uh, I see a majority within the parliament to go for a global environmental budget yeah, so that there is a minimum budget yeah, which has to be used yeah, for uh, agri-environmental measures. The, the one is the idea of the eco schemes in the first pillar yeah, and the other ones are the traditional agri-environmental uh, measures in, in the second uh, pillar uh, that uh, uh, farmers um, have a contract for uh, five years, for example. Uh, that's the case in my region. I know that's different in, in the different member states of the European uh, Union. And there we have some regions that there we have a, 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 a tradition for decades uh, uh, where we have um, uh, a very successful um, implemented um, agri-environmental uh, measures. But uh, uh, we cannot leave that decision uh, how many uh, how much money uh, uh, is uh, reserved uh, uh, for that measures to the member states uh, so that we we need to have a decision um, on a minimum budget on the european level and uh, i see that there this will be one of the major conflicts between council and uh, parliament uh, there are different views of the percentage uh, how uh, uh, many money, uh, uh, how much money should be reserved uh, for, for the agro-environmental uh, measure or for this global environmental budget. Uh, but there is consensus uh, uh, in the parliament that there is a need uh, for a decision on the European uh, level and that we cannot leave that um, up to the member states to, to decide because there, there are some uh, member states, uh, they are very ambitious when it comes to uh, the fight against climate change, when it comes to uh, uh, to the fight for more uh, biodiversity, uh, but there are other ones that they, they, are, they have more or less no ambition. Yeah? So um, uh, this will be one of the major conflicts, and I see the Parliament uh, united that we are uh, more ambitious in, in that area than the, than the Council. And Martin? Yeah, as a scientist, I should say it's uh, it's it's quite simple. Uh, uh, we need to flip the switch from uh, rewarding on the basis of output parameters like 
your production uh, volume or your land uh, uh, size uh, uh, to uh, input parameters like uh, uh, what Kurt said, uh, the societal services, but also about the resource management. Uh, how good are you in, in, in reusing the, 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 the available uh, uh, resources? Uh, uh, I be aware of the, the, the political complexity of that, but uh, yeah, from a scientific perspective, it's that simple. Just think the other way around, not from production, but from uh, 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 the, the input to the production. Okay, our next question from Slido is from Eddie Wax at Politico. Uh, he asks, it's a question for Norbert Linz, what kinds of criteria should the new EU-wide animal welfare label take into account? Should it include how the animal is slaughtered? Uh, so, as, it, as you know, no, we are uh, we are just started this discussion on the animal welfare label, and then, as I mentioned before, I'm in, in favor uh, uh, that um, uh, that there uh, will be an uh, animal welfare label on label on the European uh, level in in the future. I'm uh, uh, I would not be in favor uh, that each member state has his own animal welfare. A label no, with uh, different uh, different elements in and at the end no, uh, um, we uh, uh, yeah or that might be a risk there might be a risk no, that we destroy the internal uh, the internal market um, but um, in in my view no, that, that could be a good idea uh, to include the question on um, on slaughtering the uh, the animals into uh, this label. There are, for example, in my region, there are good new ideas um, how to guarantee that, that uh, the animal is slaughtered uh, as close as possible uh, uh, to the farm uh, where uh, the animal lived. Uh, Julie, I think you have your hand raised. No, I'm, I'm trying to listen to Norbert. <laughs> ah, okay, good. You have your finger on the headphone. I keep mistaking that for a raised hand. Does anyone else have a comment on this slaughter issue? No, okay, so we'll move on to the next question. Uh, we have a question, I lost it. Uh, yes, from Anka Haminga. Uh, she asks, how linked are the targets for 30% organic land farming to organic animal production? That may be a question for Kurt. Do you have an answer for that, Kurt? The target is 25% uh, organic farming in 2030. Is there a link between uh, the target of uh, organic animals? Well, it's not specified in, 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 in um, the Green Deal or in the Farm to Fork strategy about what's the role of organic livestock farming in that. And like now, all the participants today, and maybe we should ask somebody who is against it, but we all agree that livestock is, is, is a part of uh, the future of, of, of sustainable agriculture. And of course, we think also that that's, that's true. But as I mentioned before, um, we can't realize our, our sustainable goals or uh, different goals without lowering our livestock production. So in the that means also for, for organic, yeah, um, that we need livestock, organic livestock, but of course we need the growth in um, vegetable production and arable production and so on. Does anyone have a, a comment on that target question? Okay, here's an interesting question that came in uh, from uh, Anonymous on Slido. Which of the livestock groups cattle, pigs, or poultry, do you think should be reduced with more urgency in order to improve sustainability? Does anyone have a, an idea on that, Martin? Yeah, that's not a relevant question. We have cows, we have ruminants, we have uh, uh, pigs, and we have chicken because uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the long past to go, uh, we identified them as very good in, uh, in being part of, uh, of, 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 of our small-scale food system we had then, uh, because uh, ruminants can, can digest uh, uh, biomass that we as humans cannot digest and convert it into nutritious food. 
uh, pigs has a digestion system which is very close to the humans, so they are able to cope with uh, food residuals, whereas chickens are uh, really the omnivores that uh, that 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 can work with all kind of biomass and all kind all all uh, kind of small creatures. Think of. Uh, insects and worms uh, that grows on, uh, on 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 small biomass. Well, that's of course the picture of the past. You can you can transfer that in the industrial uh, uh, modernized setting that we have now. We when we want to optimize the maximum use of, of uh, biomass residuals to convert it into food and make uh, 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 using the animals for it. Then we need circular, circular cows, circular chicken, circular uh, uh, pigs. And, and coming back to the question about how much organic uh, uh, livestock you will have when there is 25% uh, of crop production uh, organic. Well, livestock is following the crop production. Livestock is following the plant production. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, it, it, it's a false assumption if, if you grow uh, specific uh, crops uh, organic for organic uh, 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 livestock farming. But if there is organic residual uh, uh, biomass wastes, and, and it is, and, and there is, there is a lot of organic residuals, then the animals that are fed with that are, are organic uh, livestock. So we have to think the other way around. We, have, we need the animals, not more than we have on the biomass and we are awarded. The better we are using the animals in the role of, uh, in, in the circular role, the more animals we need. Kurt, do you have a response as well? Yeah. Now, something we, we have forgotten in, in, in agriculture is rotation. And, and a lot of our, my colleagues know how important this is. Um, to produce crops, you need animals not only because you need um, fertilizer, but it's not a good idea to produce maize after maize after maize after maize forever. You need to rotate. And also lettuce or peas or beans or whatever, you need a rotation. And in that rotation, and I think that uh, organic farming has, has done a lot of research on that, we have uh, always put it some um, um, legumes in, in this rotation, like for instance, with uh, grass and clover. And grass and clover is very, very good feed for the animals. So if you combine food production, feed with grass clover on the same land, and after a few years, you grow some lettuce, some, some cereals or some potatoes, whatever, you do both. You produce on that land uh, food for um, humans, and you produce some feed for the animals, and that's a sustainable agricultural system if you look at it in that way. Uh, we have, oh, sorry, Jude, you have your hand raised? Uh, just very briefly, um, I'd like to echo um, Martin's comments, but also, you know, it, it isn't up to us to eliminate as such, but there is two questions that spring into my mind when that type of question is asked. Firstly, it depends what our metric is. Are we looking at getting rid of cattle, let's say, from a greenhouse gas point of view, from a land use point of view, from a biodiversity point of view, from a resource use overall, water use, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to define the metric before we decide how to deal with it. And secondly, I think it's more about making sure that the livestock that we do use are suitable for that region, that system, that climate, the resources, the market, the labor, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not about forcing all the pigs into Denmark, let's say, and all the cows into you know, Italy. It's about where is the best place to raise those livestock given the constraints of that system. And again, that comes back to a mixed system, mixed industries and learning best practices from, um, from different systems. Uh, we have this question from Anonymous, which I think is kind of relating to an idea of 
animal mistreatment leakage, if you could call it that, uh, in, in the energy sphere, we have the fear of carbon leakage. So if you regulate too stringently in Europe, then the production just goes elsewhere. So this question says, um, can we prevent European environmental schemes causing demand for cheaper Brazilian production? How do you prevent uh, more stringent regulation in Europe, just causing uh, livestock production to move out uh, elsewhere where animal welfare protection isn't as good. Anyone want to take that? Yes, uh, Kurt? Well, I think we should ask, do we need uh, Brazilian chicken on our plate here in, in Europe? Do we need Canadian cattle, uh, beef, uh, I mean beef on our plate here in Europe? I think the first question is, what can we produce in Europe uh, to feed people in, in Europe. And do we really think need, need to think that uh, food and the right to food is just uh, an issue we should deal with in a free market uh, in international trade? Or do we look at food as a uh, human right? And I think it's better to look to food as a human right than as something to trade with. So um, we need access, the right to access to food for everybody, to healthy food and enough food in, in all of Europe and outside of Europe. But uh, I think we should question the need to trade in food. So I think it uh, would be better to think of closing borders uh, for uh, some kind of food we don't need here on our plate in Europe. Jude, you have a response? Just to come back to a point that I made earlier about price, I, th I think, again, this comes back to some degree to the consumer. We have to educate, we have to help people value their local food, not just local in terms of their local farm or their local town or city, but the country and the region. And we have to appreciate that, you know, generally speaking, in the developed countries, we spend less on food than we ever have done before. Um, and if I can um, bring up the dreaded word COVID, you know, certainly in the UK, that has that does appear to have led to a greater appreciation for local food, a greater appreciation of the role agriculture has. Certainly in the UK, when we saw all of the panic buying um, during the early of uh, lockdown, so I think the responsibility is a rear is a education for the consumer, what they want, what they value, and what the consequences are if we simply buy on price without um, regards for how that's produced or where it comes from. Anyone else? Yes, Julie? Yeah, thank you. I, I speak on behalf of Animal Health Europe. We're mainly uh, global players, so for us trade is important. And of course, then I have a few questions. Do we want to produce only for Europe in Europe? Do we want to completely stop that trade? Uh, should we produce only for us and uh, not share with nations that have uh, less fertile soils or less resources? Uh, and my last, it's not a question, but if we, if we produce in, in Europe, we're certain of having the higher standards that we're discussing now, and it was also the conclusion of my uh, introduction, is that uh, if we do this uh, effectively, we can be an inspiration for other parts of the world, and we often are especially from a regulatory perspective. So I'm going to take one last question from Slido, and then I'll turn it over to the panel for some concluding uh, thoughts. And I think this is a nice question to kind of wrap up what we're trying to do here. Uh, so they ask, to avoid a segmented approach, do we need a multi-stakeholder platform to discuss the chances of digitalization and ways to implement, implement the best use of data for this purpose? What do you guys think about this idea of, of a multi-stakeholder platform to discuss the use of data. Everyone's nodding in agreement. They like the idea. Jude? Um, well, this sort of preempted my closing comment, which I've written down and begins, we need data. Yes, absolutely. Um, to sort of coin the, you know, the rather hackneyed phrase, if we can't measure, then we can't improve. And if we don't have data, then we can't see where the trends are, see where the opportunities are, learn from our mistakes and get better, both from an animal health point of view and from an overall sustainability point of view. So yes, I, I absolutely always welcome anything that comes with data if 
we use that data. We have to be able to get it and to use it, not just to have it as a useful thing. Makes sense. Uh, Kurt? Yes, of course, we need data. And for instance, uh, I'm a very big fan of the idea of soil passport. Uh, soil is very important for agriculture, for sustainable agriculture, but uh, we need more data about our soils. And uh, I think um, that it should be, in, it is important for all farms to have access to all kinds of data about your soil. But a very important thing is about how much will it cost to have access to all these data? Who will have the profit of this data? And uh, I hope all these data should be as free as possible uh, so as many farmers can use it. Else, again, it will be something other companies will try to make a profit on on uh, behalf of the farmers. So uh, free access to data, please. Uh, Martin and data? Yeah, actually, I should say we need connectivity. Uh, because regularity requires connectivity, connection between the producer and the consumer, finding the ways so that you're not overproducing, that you're not wasting, uh, uh, also from the resource use perspective. Uh, so that's what we need. And data are, and, 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 con and connected data systems are helping us to uh, uh, achieve that uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, so uh, it's not just the data. The data helps us to uh, 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 come to an integrated, connected uh, European food system acting in, 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 in a global uh, uh, um, environment. OK, let's turn to our yes, Julie. Yeah, that's to avoid the last nasty question. Now, um, as animal health industry, uh, we have a lot of data uh, related to animal health, related to the behavior of animals, and that's thanks to uh, the new tools we have in place. Now, the question is, what do we do with those data? How are they processed? And I was listening to Commissioner Breton the other day, and he was very worried what we do with our data in Europe. How do we process them? Uh, where are they stocked and how they're utilized? So there's still a lot to do about this. And um, yeah. OK, let's move on to our concluding statement. So I would ask each of you to sum up in one minute uh, the main thing you got out of today's discussion and where we go to next. Uh, Norbert, let's start with you. So thank you very much. I think this was a very uh, important and, and um, good uh, discussion. Um, uh, which, uh, which, where we have a lot of food for uh, thought um, for for the coming uh, weeks and and years, where we have to discuss, for example, the, um, this uh, two important strategy strategies from the Commission, the farm to fork and the biodiversity strategy. But I think once more, I think we are right as as, as agri committee that we ask. Um, when it comes to these strategies for proper impact assessment, uh, that we need science, that we need research, and that we know uh, what will happen on, on what will happen on the European uh, food uh, market uh, when it comes to the implementation of the farm to fork strategy and um, uh, and the biodiversity strategy. For example. Uh, the question of uh, livestock le leakage or food leakage uh, in the European Union, uh, it's not only a question uh, how do we import more from Brazil or from, from the United States, for example, uh, next to us. Uh, there we have Ukraine, uh, 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 a country you know, where we have the best soil, um, where we have the best soil in, in, in Europe. Yeah? I think there we need um, a proper uh, impact assessment um, before we can decide um, as uh, legislators on um, uh, reduction targets and um, on, uh, for example, on, on, on the question uh, which is the right percentage uh, for organic farming uh, till uh, 20 or which is the right target uh, for uh, the 2030 uh, goals. Um, uh, which were, were written down in the farm to fork and the biodiversity stretch. Great. Uh, Jude, your concluding thoughts? Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for a really interesting and thought provoking um, discussion. The, the two of the main themes from my point of view being, again, 
the need for data, but also the need for open discussion and not pigeonholing um, systems, practices, um, different types of livestock, different types of farm. Um, and just to leave with a thought that, that came to me about halfway through, um, we haven't really talked in this debate, although it seems to come up in most debates on sustainability, about food waste. And we often hear that 30% of food is wasted globally. And we also hear that 20% or so of animal protein um, doesn't get to market because of diseases for which we already have either curative or preventative treatments. And so just to leave everybody with the with the sort of thought, as it were, that for every animal that we lose or any animal that takes more time to get to market, that is again a food loss. So I think this this linkage between animal health, animal disease, productivity and sustainability will be really key to look at further as we move forward with this. But again, thank you so much. It's been really good. Uh, Kurt, your concluding thoughts? We are again. Um, I, I was surprised and happily surprised to hear that we can agree on, on uh, a lot of things together in, in this panel. Um, and being from so many different uh, approaches, talking about uh, sustainable agriculture. So I think this is makes me happy to about the future, about the future of a, a more green agriculture, more sustainable agriculture in Europe. So, of course, livestock is needed uh, in a sustainable agriculture system, but um, it's not the goal to have more uh, production of our livestock. The goal is how do we feed the people in Europe and what's the part of livestock in it? And of course, we need to change our menu Less meat is, is evident, and, and, and I, I admit uh, I also need to work on that to eat less meat, but I think we all need to. Um, if we look to, to what we can see in Green Deal and Farm to Fox strategy, biodiversity strategy, this is really good, this is really important, and we should focus not on if, but on how. How can we realize these goals and start now, start today? And I've heard many interesting words i've written down like diversification that's a very important word that's word that's not one solution the solution is a diversification of uh, in our agricultural systems that's the more um sustainable and that's um the more resilient another word i've heard today which is very important resilient systems circularity is very important connectivity resource management these are the the buzzwords we need to use if we want to develop a future sustainable agriculture system and of course organic farm, farming is not the holy grail but organic farming is a, a, an honest and modest way in of inspiration about how we can realize this and um i think we, we should need this inspiration and use this inspiration to change whole the agricultural system in in europe um instruments we have and we have a lot of instruments in europe is our uh, different laws but of course and again i will say cap 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 and cap we need to change cap have a real green cap stop just giving money uh, per hectare to farmers in the, these direct payments but make really work of uh, public money for public goods, and that will make happy farmers and a greener Europe. Thank you. Martin, your concluding thoughts? Yeah, what we we discussed about sustainability this afternoon, and 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 in perspective of all the sentiments about the, uh, the the interaction of livestock and sustainability, that that lower livestock means more sustainability, uh, means that we have a big challenge. Uh, to find the proper way, uh, the proper role of livestock in the future food uh, system. Uh, we, we have to work hard on that. Uh, uh, Jude said about 30% of the food is being waste. Actually, I say only 30%, so 30% of the biomass that can be used as a circular resource in agriculture is not being used in that way. So we spending there we wasting there 70 percent so livestock is important 
we spoke about sustainability, but in Animal Health Europe, this also means that the animal health services sector also needs to modernize to another role of livestock in uh, a sustainable food system. Thank you. And finally, Julie, your concluding thoughts. I'll be very brief. I see we're over time. But uh, to come back to our hobby horse, and that's One Health, and that's all about ensuring the harmony between the way we as people interact with our farm animals and other animals, with the food we eat and with the em environment we live in. And I'm very happy that uh, this debate today wasn't concentrated alone around antimicrobial resistance, etc., because that temptation could be there. Um, animal health matters in the, in the whole uh, uh, sustainable scenario, and we are part of the solution. But we strive also for an, ex an inclusive approach to sustainability together uh, with the involved stakeholders and with the European Union to ensure the continued support for farmers in implementing the animal health tools and for true sustainability in production. And on top of that, uh, I want to echo what Jude uh, said on data. Uh, we would welcome the idea of uh, creating uh, a digital stakeholder platform for digitalization in farming, and that would also then include uh, some form of a training for the farmers because they're not all equipped. Great. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, and so I think this was a, a really good panel discussion. As Kurt mentioned, there were a lot of areas of agreement, which is surprising considering the different perspectives that everybody was coming from here. I think one particular area of, of agreement we stumbled upon at the end there is data, that there's a real need for data, and that sharing of the data is going to be key. Uh, so I want to thank our panelists for a really great discussion, and thank you all in the audience. I see everyone stuck through the whole time, so that's fantastic. I'm seeing the same number at the end that I saw at the beginning, which is always a good sign. Um, so I want to let you guys know that you can follow Animal Health EU on Twitter for more info, event follow-up, and in particular, the highlights video, which will be coming out soon. And also, you can expect a write-up about the event in Parliament Magazine. So look at the Parliament Magazine's website for that, or you can follow them on ParliMag at Twitter. Uh, so thank you all very much again for a great discussion, and I wish you all a wonderful afternoon.